as we roll into November with the protests on campuses and the horrors that are happening in, in the Gaza Strip that are making people reconsider whether they even want to cast a vote, what's really at stake for you, Dr. Mitchell, and how do we couch this for the folk uh, so that we can make some sense of it? There's so much. There's so much. I mean, one thing that you're reminding me of, especially because Gaza is so on my mind because of all of my colleagues and students around the country, literally, you know, I'm thinking about the fact that back in, I want to say 2012, so, you know, more than a decade ago, I was part of, you know, signing the um, divestment a statement from the American Studies Association, basically saying, look, we need to have divestment and sanctions against Israel for what they are doing in Gaza. And that kind of activism has been ongoing, as you know, Karen. And so for me right now, the, the moment we're in is a reminder that we never can take our foot off the pedal because the people who want to deny rights to everyone but themselves are always working in deliberate ways. And so we cannot assume that anything is settled. We always have to be moving toward making this place more decent for more people. And so for me, that is the reason why all of us have to figure out what our role is in staying in this fight and have to figure out how we're going to stay inspired and motivated to do it, right? Because not giving in to despair and thinking this country is never going to be decent toward me and mine, this country is never going to be decent in its dealings across the world, to think that is very tempting to just be like, it's never gonna get better. Let me just do what I can do for me and mine and ignore the rest. That is a tempting thing. And I just want us to recognize that that's tempting and human, but that we have to make deliberate decisions to connect to each other and connect to each other's humanity in order to stay in this fight to make things more decent for more people. The other thing that you have me thinking about when you shared that beautiful clip with us and as you brought to us this idea about flags and, and the, the powerful messages that are being sent with flags, it immediately made me think of a couple things. Before the pandemic, one of my last lectures in person was in Kansas, in the land of John Brown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was being shown around by a historian who had invited me to give this endowed lecture that they have every year. And he was showing me around and he took me to some sites related to John Brown. And as we were coming up, he pointed out that there was this house that he always noticed whenever he brought visitors to the John Brown site. That house used to have a Confederate flag on it, but now it had an American flag on it. And he said he was perplexed by that. And I said, no need to be perplexed with Donald Trump in the White House that American flag signifies exactly what he wanted it to signify. So you had me thinking about that. You also had me thinking about, as I think about Aunt Dolores and her buying that house and having to finagle to do it, thinking about the fact that, you know, I had to sign that my husband knew I was buying this house and selling this house, right? So to your point, we're not too far removed. But the other thing that's related to flags that you have me thinking about is the fact that as I run, whether it is in Bexley, Ohio, or in North Bar Northboro, Massachusetts, I'm running into what most people would call the Blue Lives Matter flag. I'm running mm -hmm. into all of, like, all of the I'm veterans for Trump. Um, Trump 2024, like all of those signs are around to remind me that my fellow Americans do not necessarily believe that I should have the same rights that they have. So for my money, Karen, what that means is that we all have to remember that what we are dealing with is a power structure that is happy to have us all pay attention only to that which is disrupting and making more room for more humanity. It wants us to not notice when the people who are benefiting from all of our exploitation are benefiting from all of our exploitation. So for me, we just all have to find ways to stay in the fight in whatever realms that we're in. Yes. <clears throat> 
there is though fatigue, right? And I, I'm often reminded that even the civil rights movement, not everybody, Mac, as a matter of fact, majority of black people did not participate. Majority of black people did not boycott, did not do sit-ins, did not march. Um, we are a nation, a world of bandwagon jumpers. The folk that are always on the front, it's usually a few. Uh, there's a scripture that says narrow is the road that leads to salvation. Few will travel it. Few people are going to be out front, you know. The rest of us usually wait to see, you know, if they're going to make it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, because we don't, we don't want to, you know, try that, that rough road. Somebody else needs to pave it for us. And, um, you know, it is frustrating because those people are always the ones that are beleaguered and tired because they're the ones doing most of the work. And then the rest of us will jump on the bandwagon when the work is done, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to encourage everybody to do some work. Yeah. Everyone, pick up a shovel, do some work so that the ones that are out there that don't have to work so hard and then usually fall out from exhaustion and die <laughs> before their time. Plus, the more of us out there with our shovels, the less the opportunity is for the power structure to to act because you can't get rid of everybody even though it does seem in gaza strip that it's it's not a a, a hard task to get rid of a million people yeah. wow yeah. like we're witnessing what that looks like right um but that is years and years and years of disenfranchisement years and years and years of starvation of poverty of you know so so now it's easy but this is not this didn't just happen in march is the point exactly. um but we can look at that to see how that works in our neighborhoods we were talking yesterday with bakari and i was thinking as he was talking that i didn't talk about it how so many black neighborhoods are off of highways direct highways where tanks can just roll in mm -hmm. we don't think about that the the urban development in many major cities was done by somebody who did not value black people as humans, right? We don't talk about the architect of these cities, even the projects done on purpose, right? But we live in these places without thought and we live in these places because we just put our heads down and work that we ain't got time to really think about how we're positioned yeah. easily to be extracted and taken out and put in. We are literally in quote unquote ghettos, which if we go back to Italy before Germany, Mm -hmm. were developed to put people into destroy like the ghettos were where people went in Nazi Germany before they went to the concentration camps yeah. right and we are proud and we rap about being in the ghettos and I'm not saying that you know there's uh you know this elite conversation where everyone should have but everyone should have a nice life everyone should have things because we have enough for everyone to have enough right absolutely have could be them. somebody with a thousand homes and a thousand acres of land and people are going to bed without homes and it's not about exceptionalism it's not that they didn't work hard enough matter mm -hmm. of fact poor people work harder because they gotta usually take a bus or a train and they have to work a lot harder for a lot less money yeah then somebody that is criminalizing people for being oh houseless it the is it's, it's so upside down in this world right now and and we we need to talk more about it so you know kudos to the kids that are putting their their careers their futures their lives on the line protesting and not being anti-semitic but protesting inhumane behavior and and requiring more for their dollars that they are putting into a, a university system yeah you know the customer's always right that's what we were talking about yesterday yes and politically none of us have a right to check out at this point not for you. This is not a personal choice. None of us should be voting just for our own comfort. Yeah. This is about 50 years from now. This is about 100 years from now. This is about your children and grandchildren. What kind of world do you want to live? Leave for them. And you sitting out this one? Because there's so many people that had regrets in 2016, not just Eddie Glaub, not just Mark Lamont Hill voted for it, didn't vote for Hillary, and now we got Trump. Because there's two people. It was a whole lot of people that didn't vote and regretted it. Yeah. And no, we didn't die under Trump, but some people did die under Trump. Wow. And January 6th happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We watched it happen. And we know if there were black people, it would have been different. So if you can say that, why are you okay with letting this happen again? Mm -hmm. they, they're now, um, they've hired more police, even though crime is down everywhere. So, so again, the narrative is, is cause crime, 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 crime is so much crime. It's actually not the truth. It's not the truth. Now, if you live somewhere where there's crime, you're not going to believe that the crime is down. 
right? But New York, for example, crime is actually down, but they are militarizing and hiring more, and they're doing more with police, primarily because the mayor is former police officer. I'm going to say less about him. But um, here we are. Here we are with more with more police being being. I'm trying to find the story now because I have it. I have it. Hold on, hold on, Smith. Don't 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 get me off of here. Hold on, hold on. And that's Airlines. the perfect example of status quo. Even if the even if thing crime is going down, I'm going to keep things exactly as they are by having the same narrative that makes everybody sit back and give me the reins to put money into police and out of libraries, hospitals, etc. There we go. Uh, police departments across the United States are reporting an increase in their ranks for the first time since COVID-19. More sworn officers were hired in 2023 than any one of the previous four years. Fewer officers overall resigned or retired. Remember, they were like, oh, fatigue. You know what the fatigue is in the healthcare industry? We got less okay. doctors, less nurses. Less... Well, hello, more police. Who, mm-hmm. who? We don't want them showing up if you're having a mental health crisis, but eh. <laughs> we're going to bring in more police, more police, and we're going to arm them with more, more things. These children on these campuses, they're not a threat to your, your safety. Why are you b- bringing their arms behind their neck and throwing them onto the ground? Why are you grabbing up teachers who got pocketbooks? They're not a threat to you at all. Why do we need two grown men with their knees on the back of a, of a tiny woman? What, yeah. is, what, what is in your mind that makes that make sense? Yeah. As a human being, is that your job? It, have you been deputized to go and place bodily harm on these people have they told you that go out and throw these kids on the ground is this because it feels like they're doing it with such glee yeah. it's disgusting it's disgusting 20 yeah. percent drop in resignations so there there must be a benefit there must be more money being offered and we know that it's a cabal so, mm-hmm. you know, if you're a horrible person with friends, you're going to get your friends to join you so that you can do like they did when they when they um, hemmed up those two black boys and shot one of them in the mouth because they were living oh, with a yeah. black white woman. Yeah, because the they goon were, squad. These, yeah, the goon squad. Yeah. yeah. Now, how many goon squads are there? Yeah. That and, we don't know about. And this this is what's yes. so painful about all of this is that it's all about you need to know your proper place. The police are in place in order to keep so-called law and order, but in this unjust society, law and order means the order of a certain kind of person on top and a certain kind of person on bottom. And even if what you're doing is just saying that there should be humanity um, in our foreign policy as it relates to Israel and Gaza, if you're saying there should be humanity in there, then maybe you don't know your proper place because we call the shots here. I don't know how this is going to end, though, um, because he- here's what I'm hearing. If Trump loses, they're going to say the election was stolen. They've already teed that up. And they're going to say this government is so beyond the ready. We already know how many people are armed, have been prepping for this. This is a direct assault on your whiteness. <laughs> they don't use that on your patriotism. And we're going to see holy help if Trump wins. Project 2025 says day one, here's what we're going to do. And I do uh, ask all of you to download it. It's, it's downloadable, by the way. Yep. You don't have to buy it. It's, yep. it's there. So what, <laughs> Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Karita Mitchell is here. What, why do you think they've made it? <sighs> because they know we're not going to read it? <laughs> it we, like it's, I mean, it is the perverse flex of we are going to do it all in your face. The villains in the United States history and its present are always clear about their agenda, Karen. They have never hidden the ball. They are clear about their agenda. The people who are not clear are the so-called good and decent white people who think that they can avoid conflict and have a nation that is good and decent. So the villains have always been clear. Now, it is absolutely the case that we all have to continue to do our part. And for me, part of what that means is trying to get more and more good and decent white people to get in the fight in a proactive way, right? Similar to Olivia Cole, for example, if I'm being honest. But like that is part of my agenda because it's not as if people of color haven't been doing everything that we can think to do. We need more people to mobilize who think that if they avoid conflict, they're good and decent. No, they have to be proactive. The other thing I'll say is, for me, that 
warning about how if Trump loses and things will be bad in certain ways, that cannot make any of us cower, especially so-called good and decent white people. We have to proactively work for our vision of a better society. And the only choice is to prevent Project 2025 from going into place. Well, I'm um, looking at it right now. The first section is taking the reins of government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> taking the, that, that even sounds like a thing. Uh, Rick Dearborn writes about the White House and how they're going to do that. And uh, then there's a central personal agencies managing the bureaucracy. You know, they want to drain the swamp as they bring swamp creatures in. Uh, you know, they want to decentralize Washington and spread it out to the, to the red states. All of those good government jobs that are mostly held by black people going to go to folk, uh, the hillbilly horde all over. And I'm not, it's not a disparagement of people who call themselves hillbillies. Well, I mean, part of what is so stunning to me about the plan is the goal is to make sure that people who would be basically called civil servants, like, you know, diplomats or the people who are part of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, those kinds of offices that are about protecting the environment and the nation and protecting a public good, they want to make sure that even if your job is just to protect the public good, that you will basically be beholden to this Heritage Foundation logic and ideology. Like, so in other words, civil servants are not just more, um, they're not career that will do their job regardless of who is president. They are having to pledge allegiance, basically. And so... Mm -hmm. To my mind, that is one of the most frightening parts of it, because to me, that suggests that whether Trump is the person or not, it will go into effect. Yeah.